the level by which you are aware of and know and submit to his sovereignty is the level by which you will function in the authority he's given you. Hey, church family. This is a new episode of Unpacked on Romans 13. Romans 13 starts with, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Before we try and break down what being subject means to us, we have to more importantly understand who God is to us. And Joel shared in his teaching in Romans 13 that God is in control. And you might be saying, hey, that sounds a little pretty, but I still have some questions about it. Well, Joel has some answers. You had the opportunity to ask your questions about his teaching on Romans 13. And this episode is dedicated to answering those questions. Hey, I'm Erin. And my name is David. Come for the word and stay to hear your questions answered. If you love this format and you're excited to watch it, go ahead and like the video and comment to let us know how you're enjoying it. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell so that you can be notified anytime that we release a video like this. And we wanna say thank you to those of you who give. You are changing lives by creating opportunities for brothers and sisters all over the globe to tune in and be ministered to. So if you would like to give, go ahead and text the number that you see on your screen. Before we get to the episode, we wanna share an announcement, something that's coming up very quickly. Wednesday, September 1st, we will be having a worship night 6.30 p.m., but why is this important? Well, worship is our expression, our physical expression of our gratitude towards God. And worshiping together helps build our faith and it publicly demonstrates our obedience to the command to love God. If you're in the area, go ahead and make your way on over. But if you're not, no worries. This will be live streamed. The easiest way to do that would be to go to our YouTube channel or you can go to our website. Now let's get into the episode. Hey, welcome to Unpacked, and this is kind of a special version of Unpacked. As we mentioned on Sunday, uh, many of you submitted questions based upon the teachings on Romans 13, which deals with the relationship between the church and the state. And we got a lot of questions in, and I could tell in reading through all the questions that they were really important to you, and they are important to us as we understand what God teaches in His Word for us as being both citizens of the kingdom of heaven and citizens of our nation. Now, we're not going to be able to answer all the questions because there were so many. So we put them into kind of three categories that we're going to talk about. And in those categories, as we talk about them, I think many of you will hear your questions being answered. And those questions deal with unity in disagreement. How can we be one as the body of Christ, as a church, when we disagree on issues? Secondly, what do you do when you're in conflict with the state? What do you do when you're in conflict with the government? And then thirdly, what about submission to God's authority? Many of you ask questions around the God's authority piece and how to walk in that submission to God's authority, not just to the authority of the state. Uh, because we can't deal with all the questions, I want to just make a comment before we jump into this. For those of you who asked really questions of a very personal nature, you're looking for personal counsel, I really commend you for reaching out can I encourage you to contact a pastor, call the church, contact a pastor you know, talk to your community leader, and ask that question to them so you can sit down and kind of get some one-on-one -on -one counsel. Some of you asked very uh, rich theological questions, and we can touch on them, and we will. But again, I'd encourage you to take a look at uh, Cottonwood College as a place where you can take courses and really get to the depth of things like God's sovereignty and our free will and how those work together. And then some of you asked very much contextual questions around your age group. How do, as a younger generation, how do we deal in a progressive society? Um, get into one of our communities because it's there you'll discover like-minded people who are asking the same question and together you can find those answers. But for now, let's jump into this and let's look at our questions in light of these three areas. But before we do, one last thought for you. When you talk about some issues as a Christian, it's easy to kind of think of them in terms of the principles and the precepts and, you know, we need an answer 
some of your questions I could tell, and I understand it were, you know, just tell me what to do. Do I get the shot? Do I not get the shot? Tell me what to do. It doesn't really work that way. God wants everything we're living through, everything we're figuring out, he wants us to see it in relationship to him. And a relationship can thrive in crisis. So even as we look at the answers to these questions you've submitted, we're going to look at it through the filter of my relationship with God and how I grow in my relationship with God. I'm not just looking for a principle that I can apply, but I'm looking for a person who will guide me, the person of Jesus Christ, and give me his direction for life. Three areas the questions came in. First one was unity when there is disagreement. I'm going to start by giving you this verse that seems to apply to many of the questions that were asked. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes this in verses 24 and 25. God has put the body together so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. The Bible teaches really clearly that we don't create unity. In Jesus' prayer in John 17, he talks about the fact that it's given. You've given me your glory that I've given to them, that they may be one. Unity in the body of Christ is something that is supernatural and divine. It's not like unity in the world. It's not based upon same ideas. It's not based upon tolerance. It's not based upon emotion. Unity in the body of Christ is we exist to reflect God. God is unity. Father, Son, and Spirit. And he says, may they be one so that the world will know. It is a witness of God's love to a divided world. And we talked about this a bit on Sunday. I had a friend who's a pastor. And months ago, he was outside the front of his church and people were coming in for service and a lady came in and uh, following her or, or beside her, not a person she knew, was a guy who was in a mask coming in. The lady said in kind of a disdained voice, oh, just tell people with masks to stay at home. This lady had a choice, a witness of God's love in unity or a position on masks. The Bible teaches really clearly that any separation we have from other Christians is due to one thing, unrepentant sin. We can cause some separation when there's unrepentant sin for the sake of their redemption. But separation doesn't take place because we have differences of opinions. So many of you wrote the question, how can we have unity when there are these differences? You've got to see this from God's design. God's design is unity in diversity, not in unanimity the same way we think. He actually wants us and sees the value of these differences. Jesus himself did this. When he collected the 12 disciples and called them, he had two of them. One was called Simon the Zealot. He was a revolutionary, a terrorist who wanted to kill the Roman government. The other was Matthew the tax collector. He actually worked with the Roman government against the Jewish people. He called these two people very different in their political ideas, very different in their history. And he said, you're going to be together. And it was a picture of what unity is. Now, unity is not the elimination of talking about issues. Many of your questions say, does that mean we don't even talk about these kinds of issues? No. Issues in society need to be engaged by Christians, but we do it from a different perspective. And in answer to some of the questions on unity, I want to share with you just three ways in which we as Christians engage in these issues with each other. First, we engage with them biblically. We don't let society frame the truth of the issues. Just because society talks about it in one way doesn't mean we talk about it in that same way. We prioritize a biblical approach towards it first. Let's use the example of the vaccine. Many of you ask questions around the vaccine. You can talk about it medically, you can talk about it politically, or you can talk about it biblically. Does the Bible talk about it? Does the Bible give us insights to it? Does the Bible reference it? And you need to engage with a diverse group of Christians in order for you to grow. We have a tendency to want to hang with the people who talk about issues the way we think about them, rather than talking about it with people who have a different approach towards them. So first, we've got to engage biblically with these issues, which is what we're doing in our study of Romans and what we're doing here with this show. Secondly, we have to engage relationally. Jesus taught us how to treat people 
who had a different viewpoint than we did, how we should relate to them, how we should understand them, first as people, as brothers and sisters. So we engage relationally with this, where we're focused on what we have on common is the person of Jesus Christ. But thirdly, we engage humbly. Make sure you clarify your disagreement. This is what happened to me recently, and I think it really holds true. Remember, there is an enemy who tries to bring division in the body of Christ. So we engage with issues honestly and realistically, biblically framed by God's truth, not necessarily by how society would look at it, but we engage in it humbly as well where we look at it. Here's what takes place. You have to make sure that you understand how you may disagree on an issue with another Christian. I have a good friend and we don't see eye to eye on issues, but the more we talked about how we disagree on some of the issues, we don't really disagree on the values. We disagree on the plan for society. For example, because we're Christians and we hold the Bibles as our truth, we both agree that, you know what, we should help poor people. It's biblical. Now, how we should help poor people? We may not see eye to eye on that, but the core value of it, we hold the same. The execution of it is where our differences is. We both agree that people should work and should contribute and should be given the opportunity to do so. How that can best take place in society, we may disagree on. And you may discover that as a Christian with other Christians, the differences is not in the value because we have scripture that lay the foundation of our value. It's in the execution. So we don't stop dealing with issues, but we deal with issues differently than the world deal with issues. If you allow society to frame the conversation that you have, it will be very difficult to see that unity take place. But if you allow the Bible and the relationship foundation of Christ and a humility where you're going to engage with each other, one of the things God talks about when we influence each other and bring each other more towards an understanding is there's a need for grace and truth and time. Unity is this incredible gift that God has given us. Disagreement is there because diversity is there. If there wasn't disagreement, there wouldn't be diversity. So don't be afraid of the disagreement. Don't run away from the disagreement. Don't stop talking about issues so there isn't disagreement, but handle the disagreement biblically and understand the disagreement. How is your relationship with God defined by your stewardship of unity? Because this is about a relationship that we have with God and the responsibility we have to steward unity. Remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 24 and 25, God has put the body together so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. We're not called to create unity, but we are called to steward unity. It's the responsibility of pastors. We don't talk about this a lot, but our pastors are engaged with other pastors creating unity. Pastor Bayless and Pastor Harrison working with other pastors, other churches globally, bringing a sense of unity. Pastor Kenneth going to other churches, engaging with pastors. It happens on the pastoral level where there's a sense of responsibility we have as leaders of the church, but it also happens on the every person level where there's a responsibility we each have to steward the unity that God has for us. And you do that by finding your family locally, but finding your family globally. On Sunday, I made a reference to the persecuted church. If that was new for you, if that was different for you, take some time and discover your brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. Pray for them. Do you know what you're doing? You're stewarding the unity that God gave you. And God will create in you a heart out of a relationship with him that will position you then to engage with other Christians with difference of opinions and you can celebrate the diversity and the differences because our unity is based on Jesus and who he is. There will be disagreement. Don't run from it. Don't be afraid of it. Bring unity above the disagreement. 
Here's a second category that many questions came through, and that was honestly the issue of the conflict with the state. Many of you asked questions around, should I go against the state? Can I go against the state? How do I know when it's right to go against the state? And what I really appreciated about your questions is they weren't theoretical. Some of you are facing this right now. The government, you know, is telling the society we should get a vaccine, for example. Some of you in your jobs are being told you have to get a vaccine, and you're trying to understand what is God teaching you through this. Here's a verse that I think lays a foundation for us. Matthew 5, 13 says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. How do you determine God's will for your response to the government? Many of those questions are being answered by just a few thoughts I have for you in how you can determine God's will. Because I know it'd be great if you know I could just tell you, here's what you do, do this or don't do this or do this or don't do this. But this is about a relationship that you have with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, guiding you into what you can have a confidence in being directed by the Lord personally. There's a few ways that you determine God's will for your response to the state. One, of course, is it's based on an understanding of what the Word teaches. And there are biblical precedents for a response to the state when you go against the state. One of the obvious ones is an Old Testament story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When the state said, you will bow down to this idol. And they said, no, I'm not going to bow down to an idol because God tells me not to do that. This is the precedent of when you refuse to go against what God has directed when the state tells you to do so. Now, truthfully, that's a fairly rare experience currently in the society that we live in. It happened to me one time when I was in a different country and there was a, a event going on and there were people of different faiths that were represented and I had no problem with that. I can have a meal with somebody who is a leader of a different faith for sure. But then there was a time when we were all asked to pray together, but to pray to a Hindu God and I couldn't do it. And I had to respectfully say, no, I'm not gonna do that because it goes against my faith. There's another biblical precedent in the New Testament where Peter is preaching the gospel and he's called in by his governing authorities who say, you know, go about your life, but don't preach the gospel. He says, no, I've got to do this. This is not where you refuse to do something, but this is where you are choosing to do something for God, even though you may be telling no. This has happened to me a few times when I have been in situations where because of the separation of church and state in our society, there are certain regulations about what you can say and cannot say in conversations. And I was in this one situation in a government institution and I was told by the directives, you can't talk about Jesus. But in this moment, I just knew with this individual I was having a conversation with, I had to talk about Jesus. And so I went against the regulation and I spoke about Jesus. There are these Bible cases, and you need to study them, not just for this week or this month, but really for your life. Jesus is on trial by the state, the Roman uh, leader. How does he respond to that? But here's the challenge. Let's be honest about this. For the greatest majority of us, the issue we face in making a decision about going against the state is not a Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego issue. It's not the state coming against us saying, bow down to this false idol. It's not that black and white. For most of us, the issue is an issue that isn't as clearly spoken about in Scripture. For example, one of the issues that came through many of your questions was whether or not you should get the vaccine and should you go against the state. The Bible actually doesn't talk about a vaccine. And there are different opinions about this. That's why on Sunday, we taught and learned from Romans 13 about a matter of conscience, where you have to have a confidence in what God has taught you so that you are acting in a conviction of what, he's, what you truly believe is his will. And you take his word, and you take the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, and you take counsel from spiritual leaders. And then you have this sense of conscience. Again, remember, it's about a relationship with God. Let's talk about the Council of Spiritual Leaders for a second because this becomes very important, the interaction that you have. That's why on a moment like this, it's very hard because I'm speaking to you as an audience. 
But it's so important that you get with spiritual leaders that you can talk with and you can interact with. Because these issues are not just quick answer issues. It's not just about getting the right answer. It's about growing in your relationship with God where you are trusting a person in being able to go forward. And again, I want to encourage you. For many of you who wrote in the questions, I know these are really serious, perilous times for you. Call the church. Talk to a pastor. Talk to your community leader to, to get direction on this so that the conscience position you have is one in which you have a confidence in. We use the word. We use spiritual leaders. We use uh, the wisdom that God gives us. You know, there's a story in the Old Testament of King Solomon and two prostitutes come to him and it's the story we're all familiar with about this child and who does a child belong to. Have you ever wondered why a king of a nation would be willing to settle an issue of two prostitutes? And these are the lowest of the low in society. And yet the king of the nation is going to settle this issue. And we know the story about how Solomon says, well, we'll just cut the baby in half. And the true mother reaches out and says, no. And Solomon's seen as having great wisdom. That story is put in there, I believe, to really teach us about the nature of wisdom. That God gives wisdom. Many of your questions, some of your questions, really felt like God was being silent, like you couldn't figure it out, like you were lost. The New Testament teaches very clearly that God grants wisdom. So first, do not believe the thought that God is silent. He is not. But he's wanting you not just to get a truth, but to get a person. And he's wanting to enhance the relationship. So he wants you to search and he wants you to engage and he wants you to work in doing this. But there's a second thing that this Solomon story teaches us about God and wisdom. Whatever is your king will be the source of wisdom. If a certain political position is your king, that will be the source of wisdom. If a certain vocation is your king, that will be the source of wisdom. Whatever is your king will be the source of wisdom. And that's why I say these issues are incredibly important, but they have to be answered by you in the context of a relationship with God, not just an answer to a question. And you get a sense, a conviction from the Lord, and then you can stand in that conviction and you can have a grace for others who may stand with a different conviction. How do you engage with a non-Christian government? Romans 13, Paul clearly taught us that we are required to participate for what God's purpose is. Now, we're fortunate still in America that the form of government we have is a democracy. So we can participate in the government. It's not true for many Christians around the world. And as a democracy, we can participate through protest. And there have been times in our history that protests have brought about a really good change of government and change of laws that are important. And it is Christians' responsibility to be able to do that. There's a story in the book of Acts where there is a slave girl who is demon-possessed and she is saved, but she's owned by men. And in that economic system, her salvation creates a real turmoil for them and then for her. Part of the story in that book of Acts is we have got to make sure that the structures of society allow people to flourish in their faith. A teenager who lives in the inner city that is gang infested can become a Christian, but will greatly struggle to really grow and flourish in their faith if they are under enormous pressure to join a gang or to be involved in other activities. And their family gets beat up. So we have a responsibility as Christians to be involved in society. And in a democracy, we can do that through protests. And we can do that through a positive influence as well. That's what Paul taught in Romans 13. Do good and be commended. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. But we're doing it not just for this moment. We're doing it because we want to create an infrastructure in society that will allow Christians to flourish because it represents the kingdom of God. When I talked about this, and I talked about the fact that Constantine tried to make, you know, make Rome Christian, and I said, we have to be careful. And the Roman emperor Constantine said, you know what? All of Rome is gonna be a Christian nation. Everybody's gonna become a Christian. Now we would think, whoa, I've been hoping for that here in America. You know what happened to the church? 
became completely weak, totally dissolved, because it didn't have to rely on the sovereignty of God anymore. Now it was relying on earthly systems for its authority. My point wasn't to say you shouldn't be engaged in issues. Of course, we should be engaged in issues. Christians should be the best citizens. It was just to give a warning that you can't legislate repentance. It's not possible. The Romans, you know, didn't follow the law. And then Constantine made it a Christian nation. But it didn't mean all of a sudden they were all in a relationship with God. So here we are as citizens of two kingdoms, and it's our responsibility to be citizens in this state. And when there are issues and areas that don't match up with the kingdom of God, by all means, we need to be highly engaged in being able to do that. For the sake of the kingdom, we need to sometimes possibly stand against the state at a matter of conscience because we know what the word says and because we've been led by the spirit. And a few times it may be very absolute, like, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But some of the time, it's going to be a lot more gray. And that's where your relationship with Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit will kick in. That's also where grace needs to kick in because there will be different consciences. I have a friend, and he works with undocumented aliens who are in this nation. And some of the work that he does with them kind of crosses the line of what the state allows. For him, his matter of conscience in reaching them for the kingdom and for Jesus, he does that. There's some of you who are watching this who may not even like me using that illustration because you would say, no, the laws against illegal aliens are right. And your matter of conscience says, no, we're going to obey those laws. And you can see it gets a little sketchy in a diverse body of Christ. There's going to be differences even in our positions against the state. And that's where there is a grace that we hold because what unifies us is not our idea about when and how we come against the state. What unifies us is our idea that there is a kingdom with a king who is sovereign and has all authority. How is your relationship with God? How does that shape your citizenship? Again, Matthew 5.13 says this, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. That's why we're the best citizens. Because we want to be a light for our society. Then there was a third issue that came up. This one in some ways is less controversial. But I think it's really essential. And I was grateful that many of you asked questions around submitting to God's authority. Because a lot of the questions that submit to, that are around submitting to the government's authority are legitimate. But we should probably pay as much, if not more, attention to how do I submit to God's authority. Here's the verse that kind of summarizes this one. Luke 18 says this in verse 7 and 8. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on this earth? When Jesus returns, not will everything be perfect, but in my life, in my actions, and how I relate to Christians, and how I relate to society, and how I position myself with the state, will he find me trusting him and his sovereignty? There were many questions that came in around sovereignty and free will, and these were very rich, kind of deep theological questions. And I just want to touch on that. Uh, God in control does not mean God is controlling, meaning making happen or stopping from happening every single event. Because God's sovereignty and in his sovereignty, he gives people the freedom to make their own choices. He gives people control over their own lives. And this idea of God giving us the freedom, our control over our lives, is really what it means to be created in his image. Just as he is sovereign over everything, he has made us sovereign over our lives. And you have a choice as to whether you will now submit that sovereignty to God or whether you will try to carry it out. Now, that's a very simple, almost superficial answer to the idea of God's sovereignty and our free will. Again, I encourage you, the college, Cottonwood College, has numerous courses that dive deep into the scriptures to help you understand how God's sovereignty works with our free will. 
But a sovereign God, as we talked about on Sunday, delegates authority. And you asked questions around, what does that look like? How does that work? Listen to this statement. The level of which you know and submit to God's sovereignty is the level by which you will function in your authority. The level by which you are aware of and know and submit to his sovereignty is the level by which you will function in the authority he's given you. I use this kind of anecdotal statement on Sunday about, you know, Jesus being the most selfless ever has been because he gave his life for us, but then also being quite self-centered. And I know in the natural world, that word has a lot of negative connotations. But as we are called to worship God fully, where Jesus said, I am the head of the church, I am the way, everything in the Old Testament, every prophet, every teaching, every miracle, every law points to Jesus. It's all fulfilled in Jesus. He is the center of it. And I, I was dramatic in wanting to make this point because when you know and understand the complete Jesus, not the lamb only, but the lion, not just the savior, but the king, not just the selfless one, but the one with a powerful self-identity. That's the definition of God. And the more you become aware of and know his sovereignty and submit to his sovereignty, there is a direct correlation to the authority then that you will walk in. And many of you ask this question, I think maybe God challenged you about this. How do I give God control back? How do I submit to his authority and walk in it. It's a common phenomenon. This is the goodness of God where when you are hearing the word taught, the Holy Spirit kind of begins to challenge you and kind of convict you and prod you about some things in your life that need to be rearranged. So here's some thoughts as to how you do that because it was a question asked by many. Three simple steps. Number one, do an honest self-assessment. Where in your life are you not submitting to God's authority and thus not being able to walk in his authority in your life. Here's the key. You can't do that self-assessment alone. You need other people to do that self-assessment because you have blind spots. So you get other people around you and say, hey, tell me, look at my life. Tell me where you feel like I am not fully acknowledging God's authority in my life. Then when you identify those areas, step two, repent. Literally means make a 180 degree turn in those areas. So it's not kind of this ambiguous emotional repentance, God, I'm sorry. No, it's specific areas of life where you say, I haven't let you be in control and I'm going to let you be in control. And there's a conscience, mental, spiritual decision you make to do that. You tell other people that you're making that decision so there's accountability. And then step three, you act on that repentance. You act in those specific areas, in specific ways that actually gives God control. I think there are three areas in our lives where we uh, probably struggle the most in giving God full sovereignty over. Finances, marriage, and church. In finances, we want to control our money. In marriage, we want to control our spouse. We want to control what our marriage looks like. And in church, we want to control what my church experience is like. You can find all kinds of directives in scripture where God actually gives us ways in which we can acknowledge his authority and his sovereignty in being able to turn control over to him. So in finances, he says, tithe. Am I really king? Here's a way you can prove to yourself that I am sovereign over your money. Give me 10%, the first 10% of all that comes in. So yes, it's worship and it's faith, but you know what? It's an action that acknowledges his sovereignty. In marriage, he says, I want you to forgive every time. God does not count how many arguments we win in marriage. He counts how many times we forgive. It's a way that you acknowledge his sovereignty over your marriage and in church. He says, I, I want you to serve because I'm the head of the church and I am sovereign. And you don't go into a church, and I know many of you already know this and you do it well, but maybe there's a rearrangement sometimes that says, God, if this is your church and you are sovereign and I'm trusting you with your church, so I'm going to serve and have a confidence that you are building your church. This authority 
that comes to us because of an acknowledgement of God's sovereignty that he delegates to us, we, it's a lifelong journey. We know the authority that we have through the word. We exercise that authority through prayer in many ways and through our actions. We live in that authority through humility and patience. But I was grateful that many of you asked the question around Joel, explain authority more so that I can walk fully in that authority. But again, it goes back to your relationship. How is your relationship with God impacted through your authority? Luke 18, 7 and 8. Will not God bring justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? There were so many questions that came in, and I really am sorry that we're not able to take question by question, line by line, and just go through them. I pray that through these three main areas of unity in church, while there's disagreement, you know, uh, conflict with the state, and how to discern and know when and how you do that, and the relationship you have with the state, and then submission to God's authority and growing in your own authority. I pray that as we walk through that, you would see the answers to some of your questions that were reflected there. But I know for many of you, you're going, wow, I I still need more. That is where it's this lifelong relational journey. Get involved in a community. Get involved in a small group. Keep coming to church. Get into the Word. Pray this through. Let God teach you. There are so many resources that are available here for you from our pastors to our communities to the college. But let me just take a moment and pray for all of you that this season we are in, I'm convinced of this, it's like God is giving us an ecosystem in which our faith can flourish. He is giving us a a chance, an opportunity, because of all that's going on, to truly rise above the division of society and genuinely be unified with a grace and a humility and celebrate Not only the diversity, but even the disagreement, because Jesus is greater than that. He is giving us an opportunity to walk in an authority that maybe in a previous season we didn't even feel we needed. And now we discover over our families, over our cities, we need to have this authority from God. Let me pray that God will lead you on a journey with him relationally where you will grow in knowing who he is and you'll explode at a new level of faith and a new level of power and peace. Lord, I thank you for each person who watched Sunday's teaching on Romans 13, for those who submitted questions, for everyone who is searching, not just for an answer, not just for some tip, But Jesus, we're searching for you, for your lordship, for your guidance. More than ever, we want our lives and our decisions to honor and glorify you. We want the way we treat other people to bring you glory. We want the way we are citizens in this nation, whether we do good, whether we protest, to bring you glory. We want our lives to reflect you, that the world may know this living Jesus. For each and every one of us, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would guide us. You would help us to be committed to a study of your word, to a participation in relationships, spiritual relationships that will stretch us. Help us to be committed to you, that we would grow like we've never grown before in joy and faith and peace, but mostly in an intimacy with you, Jesus. We pray this in the name of Christ. Hey, one thing we do at uh, Unpacked is we look forward to the next chapter. And uh, if you thought Romans 13 was intense, wait till you get to Romans 14. Basically, we should just all make this collective word and just go, ouch, ouch. Because in Romans 14, Paul is going to talk about our relationships with people. And he's going to be pretty honest and pretty straightforward in it. 
Here's how I would recommend you prepare for Romans 14. Number one, get a list of specific names of people you just don't like. People who rub you the wrong way, people who you think are just are idiots, you know, people who you just really do not like. And we all have those people. We all know who they are. And I want you to keep those names in your mind. And then with those names in your mind, I want you to read Romans 14 three times. And as you read Romans 14, each time, more and more, with those names in your mind, Holy Spirit's going to begin to do a work on you. It'll be a work of grace, no condemnation, but it'll prepare you. Jesus has a vision for your life far beyond what you can imagine. And his vision, in many ways, is defined by how you relate to other people, how you will share him, how you will stand strong. This is what Romans 14 is all about. Jesus' vision for your life as a light to other people. Hey, the Lord bless you. Thank you for submitting all the questions. Again, I apologize that we're not able to get to them all, but I hope that some of the content and truth that we brought in this teaching answers some of those questions. Continue on your pursuit of Jesus. We'll see you at Church Sunday. God bless you. Wasn't that insightful? Many of you had some great questions. You're not alone in having questions, and we want to make sure that we do this live with you. So you can go ahead and text HOPE to 411-247. A pastor can respond, and there will be some resources available to you. Now, if you know someone who may have similar questions to the ones that Joel just answered, we want to encourage you to share this episode with them. And also, we want to hear from you, so leave a comment and tell us what your takeaway was from today's episode. Once again, if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to join us for our worship night, September 1st at 6.30 p.m. We will see you next time.